blessed life. All of us want to live a blessed life. And we learned last week that a, a blessed life is one where supernatural power is working for you. It's working for you, not against you. See, God initially intended that mankind would be blessed. It was the first thing that he did. But we know that humanity, through our own stubbornness, through our own rebellion, created a curse that affected the earth. You say, well, what's the curse? Well, in all honesty, it's when the things in our lives break down, the, our stuff wear out, the stuff that we constantly have to replace. And even good intentions, think about this, when snow falls and our DOT clear the highways, that's a blessing to us, but even that blessing corrodes and rots our car, so you have to replace it, right? We all deal with it, and God wanted our lives to be blessed. And a blessed life is one that everything that you touch prospers. So it's your life, your relationships, your family, your work, your emotions, your health, every single facet of your life, God designed and desires for you to be blessed. In fact, we learn from its original in the Hebrew, the word blessed means to be endued with power to succeed, to prosper, to be fruitful, for longevity. I mean, that's fascinating. So here's my question for all of us today. How many of us are experiencing a life like that? See, it was and remains God's desire for every single one of our lives. So hence the series. Why are we talking about this? Because it's the design for helping all of us to attain the blessed life. And so we learned last week the first reality, the key to the blessed life is generosity. The purpose of prosperity is so that we at all times, in every situation, can find ourselves so abundantly provided for that we can live generously and provide for others and bring thanksgiving to God. That's the plan. That's what God proposed. And when we think of the idea of a blessed life, a lot of people think happiness along that lines. Listen to this. I found this article that had ran in the, in the New York Times a few years ago, and it's research. You know, it's fascinating. People are, are sometimes scared of science. Do you know science will only show what, what Scripture already declares to be true? You don't have to be concerned about that end, but listen, I exerted a few parts of this. Listen to this. According to the Social Capital Community bench, Benchmark Survey, a survey of 30,000 American households People who gave money to charity in 2000 were, two, were 43% more likely than non-givers to say that they were very happy about their lives. Similarly, volunteers were 42% more likely to be very happy than non-volunteers. It didn't matter whether gifts of money or time went to churches or symphony orchestras Givers of all types of religious and secular causes were far happier than non-givers. You know, I, right away, one of the first things when people either re-enter church or come to a church for the first time, if you're here and this is not been a part of it, you are, oh my goodness, what is he talking about? You think people have like got this you know, phobia, like, wow, it's all about money. But do you know what? <laughs> Generosity really benefits you. Whether you're saved Oh, whether, you're under, whether you have a relationship with God or not. But listen to this. People who give are less sad and depressed than non-givers. The University of Michigan's panel study of income dynamics reveals that people who gave money away in 2001 were 34% less likely than non-givers to say that they felt so sad that nothing could cheer them up in the past month. They were also 68% less likely to, to have felt hopeless and 24% less likely to have said that anything was an effort. In fact, listen to this. This is so cool. This other part I pulled out of here. A number of studies have researched exactly why charity leads to happiness. The surprising conclusion, in fact, God bless you. The surprising conclusion is that giving affects our brain chemistry. Are you kidding me? See, but man was made in the image and likeness of God. Why does giving affect the brain chemistry? Listen, for example, people 
who give often report feelings of euphoria, where psychologists have referred to as the helper's high. They believe that charitable activity includes endorphins that produce a, mi a very mild version of the sensation that people feel from drugs like morphine and heroin. Charity also lowers stress hormones and cause, that cause unhappiness. In one 1998 experiment at Duke University, adults were asked to give massages to babies. The idea behind it was that giving pleasure to a baby out of the sheer act of compassion with no expectation of a reward or even a thank you in return. After the adults performed the massages, they found that they had dramatically lower levels of stress hormones, cristosol, epinephrine, and non-epinephrine in their brains. So in conclusion, the bottom line from the research is that giving is not only good for your favorite causes, it's also good for you too. For relief from stress and depression, it's probably more cost effective than whatever your doctor might prescribe. And getting a little high, it's not illegal and a lot less fattening than booze. <laughs> So it has multiple benefits. In fact, whenever you've been the party that had been responsible for helping someone else in their time of need, the euphoria, the, the feeling that you get is far greater than someone else when someone has shown up in our lives to help meet our need. We know how exciting that can be, but when you've been on the, the opposite end of that spectrum, you know how it is. Well, you guys know, whether if you don't know, let me help you on this front. 10 cents of every dollar that people give to Vertical Church, we give to World Missions. We give to things outside, and we even give beyond that. And we have developed relationships on this end. Well, a month ago, I got a call from someone that we have a relationship with, Dr. P Patricia Bailey Jones. She's the head of uh, Master's Touch Ministry. And she called me and she said, Pastor Ken, I have a crisis because I'm heading into Southern Sudan. Now, whether you know this or not, because the media, whether news... Uh, television reports or print media has not really talked much about Southern Sudan. But what is happening in Southern Sudan is the worst famine on human record, okay? Now, because of Eb Ebola, because of ISIS and other things that tend to dominate world news, it's not getting a lot of, a lot of press, not getting a lot of coverage. In fact, a lot of people remember Sudan out of all the infighting and the genocide that was going on there, Christians being killed and all. What you may not have realized is that a solution to the problems there was that Sudan was split into two nations and Southern Sudan became its own nation. And listen, it has Christian leaders as the head of the nation but they're dealing with this severe famine. Now, Pat Bailey Jones has had tremendous store of opportunity and great grace where she's influenced both the government and brought supplies and help to those in the most severe of need. And so she called me and said, Pastor Ken, here's my crisis. I'm heading in, all the supplies are ready, the trip's all set to go, but the pastor who had committed and pledged to handle the situation financially had a heart attack and died. I just got through speaking at his funeral but I did not feel that it would be right to talk to the board or the leaders of the church about the pledge that had been made to our organization. But I'm going. This is something that's an open door and I'm believing God is going to meet that need. And so I prayed about it, called Pat back and said, we at Vertical Church will supply that reality. Now listen, this last week I got a text from Pat. And this is kind of what was inspirational to me. A photo came up, show the photo. This is a photo Pat sent to me because that's Pat with this little child. And she said, your church turned this young girl's tears of hunger into a smile. Now tell me if that doesn't touch your heart. In fact, let Pat thank you directly. We are now standing in one of the most famined parts of South Sudan. Many go into Juba and make their distribution and go like the World Feeding Program and UN and UNICEF. But we come by road for four hours with roads that are indescribable to go from village to village to provide for the people that clearly no one is getting to them. The solution to South Sudan does not come from abroad. 
The solution for South Sudan comes from above. And the one from above put his power in me. So I am the solution to my nation. We don't follow the tracks of the UN. We make the tracks. The UN follows us. We don't follow them. This is the real outreach. Pastor, thank you so very much. And I just can't thank the church enough for getting behind us and helping us. You guys have always been there for Masses Church Ministries. There are no words to express our gratitude. This road is the road which we call the road as a path to famine. About 60 kilometers from here is where you see all the pictures of the starving babies, those that died en route to help. On this side of the river now, those that are living in the interior parts try to make it to the river, but they can't because of the distance and the lack of food and water. But because of you, we've been able to sustain those who clearly would not have lived. We cannot say thank you enough. And remember, when you've done it unto the least of them, you've done it unto him. God bless you and thank you. Man, guys, isn't that awesome? Give yourselves a hand because you at Vertical Church are what made that happen. I'm so proud of our church and its generosity in those fronts. But if your heart's desire is to live a generous life, and if that's your intent, to really live out what I call the blessed life, Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so if it is, remember last week, I let you in on a secret. Well, if your intent is, listen very carefully, I want to give you another secret this week, okay? Y'all got your attention? You lean in? If you're taking notes, listen to me. Our outlook, our outlook, okay, affects our outcome. Do you hear me? Our outlook affects our outcome. In other words, the way you see things, the way you look at things determines how that is. In fact, a very wealthy father who lived in the suburbs decided to show his son how poor people live. So he made arrangements to travel to a farm in the upside of his state and where the the family that owned the farm was below the line of poverty by U.S. standards. So he wanted his son to interact and so he made these arrangements. They traveled up. They spent a few days with these people who so graciously took them into their home and spent time with them. And so when they left, they went back home And the father asked his son, son, how was the trip? And the son said, it was great, dad. It really was. He said, did you learn how poor people live? He said, yeah, dad, I really did. He said, well, tell me, what did you learn? He said, well, I learned that we have one dog and they have four. He said, we have a pool that stretches to the middle of our garden, but they have a creek that knows no end. He said, we have imported lanterns that light our garden, but they have stars that light their fields. He said, we have a small piece of land that we live on, but they have land that you can't see the end of. In fact, dad, we buy our groceries. They grow their own. We have servants that serve us, but they serve others. And we have walls that we put around our property, protect us, but they have friends around them that protect them. And so the father was speechless. And the son said, thank you, dad, for showing us just how poor we are. See, it's all a matter of perspective how you look at things. And so if you have a Bible, turn with me to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 11, Proverbs 11. If you're new to Bible reading, just go to the middle of your Bible and take a right. If you go to any Bible, usually right in the middle is the book of Psalms and Proverbs is the first book after Psalms. Proverbs chapter 11, and look at this verse, verse 24. It says, one man gives freely and yet gains even more. Now stop for a moment. That doesn't make logical sense. How can you give away stuff and gain even more? And now remember, the person who wrote the book of Proverbs, this is something unknown to you, his name was Solomon. And besides Jesus, he was the wisest man that ever lived on the planet. And he said this, one person gives freely and yet gains even more, and another withholds unduly. That means excessively. And what's their outcome? but they come to poverty. Now, that's counterintuitive because we would think the way to to not be poor is to hold on to everything you have. 
But it says specifically here that to give freely. In other words, remember we learned last week, the apostle Paul had led us in because the study predominantly we're talking about is out of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. And he told us, remember this, that he who sows sparingly, the knowledge of the law of seed time and harvest works in every front. If you sow kindness, you reap kindness. And you always reap back more. Every farmer understands this. It's like the farmer who took his son for the first time out into the fields. And so let me show you the family trade, the family business. And so he filled the hopper full of seeds and they began to go out to plant their seeds out in the fields. And the son was mortified when he looked down that all the seeds were gone. He said, Father, we've lost everything we have. His father looked at him and said, don't worry, son. In a few months, you realize we haven't lost anything. We've gained. And one man gives freely and what? Gains even more. And another one withholds unduly but comes to poverty. Look at verse 25. A generous person will what? Will prosper. And whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. See, it's all about perspective. Because listen to me, both fear and faith are a matter of how you look at a matter. It's all about how you look at something, okay? It comes out of your perspective, how you view a situation. And ever notice this? We talked about this last week, that the predominant reason that many of God's children don't engage in living a generous life is because of fear. And when we fear, don't we generally act in, 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 um, in kind of crazy ways? Fear kind of makes you do things that are irrational, doesn't it? Whenever you get fearful, people, you know, they go crazy and they do stupid stuff later. They go, oh my God, what was I thinking, right? But when you get scared, that you won't have enough. Think about this, to withhold on God, in other words, to keep God out of your circumstance, okay, would be as crazy or as irrational as being held up at gunpoint by a robber and being too scared to call the police because they also carry weapons. Or this, or being too scared to go to the doctor because they might give you a shot that saves your life. The idea that somehow, some way, that I'm gonna withhold from God because of fear that I won't have enough, that I won't never, have, you know, there won't be enough food, there won't be enough to take care of my life, there won't be enough for the things that I have to have. To hold out on the one person that is absolutely guaranteed can change your circumstance is absolutely irrational. It doesn't make any sense. But God is for us. The question that comes up is do we trust him? Do we trust that God is who he said he is? That he will do what he said he will do? Because how you look at a matter will determine whether you have faith or whether you have fear that dominates you. You can't imagine a farmer holding onto his seeds going, if I sow these into the ground, I'll have nothing. No, it's irrational. And so therefore the question for us is, is God trustworthy? Is he true to his word. It's all a matter of perspective. In fact, look at this scripture in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter six, probably one of the most misunderstood scriptures. In fact, this is one of those scriptures that people read and they go, well, I don't understand. They just keep reading. They kind of ignore it. I don't get it. I mean, look at this. In Matthew six and verse 22, it says the eye is the lamp that provides light for your body. Well, that's, I can get that. And when your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light verse 23. But when your eye is bad, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, then how deep is that darkness? And you go, well, I don't get that. And just keep reading. But the bottom line is this. Let me help you to understand the scripture. Because Jesus was talking. And really, this comes out of a Hebrew idiom. Because depending on the translation, in reading the original Greek, I can tell you it was difficult for them to translate. Some of your Bibles might say straight, you know, if you have an eye that is straight, if you have it, someone said it's good. It has different ways. Some Bibles actually translate it because the proper translation would be if your eye is generous. Because this is a Hebrew idiom and the way you look at things, does your heart open to generosity or does your heart withhold into stinginess or, or being a miser, okay? So in other words, the proper, the most proper translation of this verse would say this. Generosity is the lamp of the body. 
And if you are generous, your whole body will be filled with light. But if you are miserly, then your whole body will be filled with darkness. And if the darkness in you, or if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is it? In other words, if you squintily look at life through selfishness, like I'll never have enough, how dark does your life become? Do you ever notice the people who live that way? I mean, generosity, as I said to you, is a way of life. It's not, you know, just financial. It's so many things. It's a way of looking at things. But what kind of a person are we? When we go out to dinner with someone else and we see out of the corner of our eye, out of our peripheral vision, the waitress heading towards our table with the bill, are we the type that politely get up and excuse ourselves to go to the bathroom while everybody determines how it's going to be paid? Or are we the type of person who says, excuse me, I'll take care of that. Don't worry about it. What type of individual are you? You know, when you start digging in your pocketbook and try to find, until somebody says, oh, I got that. Don't worry about it. Are you a guy that's, you know, let me think I got something down here. Are we generous or are we always making George yell? Do you know what I mean by that? You pinch the dollar so straight that even George Washington screams. No, I don't know. And Jesus is saying here, okay, that the light of our world, when you live a life of generosity, it is a perspective. It's a way of looking at life. So help me on this. As we go through the rest of this message, if you can turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. As you're turning there, listen. If you're taking notes, this is what you need to discover, okay? The generosity is a work of grace. Generosity is a work of grace. Now, what is grace? Grace is a divine empowerment. Grace is God's willingness. Grace is God working for us and through us. Because why? We are saved by grace, not of works. In other words, we can't make it on our own. Grace does for us what we are incapable of doing on our own. It's a divine cooperation. So therefore, grace is something that you yield to, not something ever that you earn. Grace is something that God lavishly bestows upon his children. But do you know what prohibits it from becoming a part of our lives? Pride. For God, strong arms. He he withholds from the proud, but gives grace to the who? The humble. Humility is the understanding everything comes from God. It's a divine cooperation. So generosity is a flow of grace. It's something that you yield to from within. And so here the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is about to acknowledge a church that perfectly illustrates the grace of generosity. And let me set it up for you, what's happening here. The Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthian church because something had gone on. When you read the book of Acts, you find out that at the end of Acts chapter 11, in the city of Antioch, a recognized prophet at the time whose name was Agabus foretold of a coming famine that would, that would devastate the region, that part of the world that people lived in. And the church had made determination to arise. The Gentile church said, we will come to the aid of our Judean brother. All the believers that are back in Jerusalem and in, the, and in the land of Israel, we will send support back. Why? Because they were living under the most severe of circumstances. Because of Roman taxation, because of all the difficulties the Jews had created that the Romans were, were, had such a stranglehold upon the culture and upon the economy. Then also the, Jew, the Jews were experiencing another thing that was happening was that the, 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 the diaspora, that means the Jews that had been living in other parts of the world, were returning back in their older years to live in the, in the city and in the country of their origin so that they would die in their homeland. But the problem was returning during their elderly years, they found themselves in the most amount of need because they couldn't work anymore. There was severe difficulties, the poverty that was going on because of overpopulation, taxation, and the famine that was happening made the conditions of what was happening in Judea so severe The Gentiles said, we will step up. We will do something about. And they freely said yes. And now the Corinthians and Corinth was a very wealthy city. Corinth, when they heard about what had happened, when Paul told them about the plight of their brethren down in Judea, they said, we'll do something about it. And and collections were made of all these Gentile churches to go back to the Judean leaders, to the apostles who were there. 
And Paul now was following up because how many people have ever made a pledge, have ever been moved by a situation? Yeah, I'll do something about that. But as time expires, we don't always fill the commitments that we made. And that was happening to the Corinthians. Now Paul's following up going, guys, this is something you said you were going to do. And he's about to motivate them by the Holy Spirit. By what he's writing in scripture is to motivate them back to this realization that they had already felt drawn to be a part of, but now embarrassed that they hadn't followed through in what they had said. And so Paul gives for them first as he begins this discourse. He tells them this, look at verse one. He said, now brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God, where does grace come from? From God. The grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches. So he uses this church as an example to the Corinthians. And what does he say on verse two? And in the midst of a very severe trial. Now in Greek, the word severe trial literally means to hit rock bottom. To be at the all time low you have ever experienced. They were in the midst of severe trial. Now this next part, well, follow along with me. In the midst of a severe trial, their overflowing joy, uh, come again? I thought you just said they were having a severe trial. Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty. So now catch the thought here. They have a severe trial and extreme poverty. If you found yourself in those conditions, what's probably the last thing that people think about during that time? Giving, right? And any person who's compassionate would say, well, you don't, you know, do you really need to do that? But let me, add, let me tell you this. The safest place in the world to be is in a position of trusting God. That's why, listen to me, fear is irrational. Don't be motivated or controlled by emotions. Allow your life to be led by truth. That's what maturity as a believer finds. Because listen, they were in the midst of severe trial and their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up into what? Rich generosity. Now, if this wasn't written in scripture, we'd all be sitting there going, you gotta be kidding me. I don't believe that, but it's right there in front of us. And it is not the word of man. It is the word of God. God said, no, despite their severe trial and despite their supreme poverty, they had overflowing joy and it welled up into rich generosity. Now look at verse three. For I testify, in other words, listen guys, Paul's saying, I bear record that this is the truth, what I'm telling you. I testify that they gave as much as they were able, okay? But he goes on to say, and even beyond their ability, you gotta be kidding me. Severe trial, extreme poverty, they gave as much as they were able and beyond their ability, entirely on their own. In other words, nobody shamed them into it. Nobody strong-armed into it. Nobody appealed to them in a way that made them feel shame or guilt to give it. They did it entirely on their own. Now look at verse four. And they urgently pleaded with us. I imagine when Paul is collecting this from the Philippian church, he realizes what severe trial they've been under. He realizes the extreme poverty they've been suffering. And he's probably going, oh my goodness, you gotta be kidding, but look what he says here. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service of the Lord's people. That would be like saying this. Parents coming to me and saying, Pastor Ken, my children beg me for the chance to share their candy with their siblings. Or it would be like this. Someone in the midst of me talking today gets up and goes, Pastor, I can't take it anymore. Take up the offering. I gotta give now. It's burning a hole in me. That was the last time you saw that. He said, I, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege. It's all, see your outlook affects your outcome. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service of the Lord's people. Verse five. And they exceeded our expectations. How? They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Now listen to me. Whenever you give your life first to God, giving anything else after that is not a problem. When God, see, God has always wanted our heart. He's not after your stuff. He wants your heart. But he knows this end because, see, 
When Jesus told us the, light, the eye is the light of the body, you gotta go what, what it's sandwiched with. In context, the three verses above that verse, Jesus said these things. He said, lay down up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupts and thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't corrupt and thieves can't break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's why the way you look at a thing determines what's in you is light or darkness, okay? And then he went on after the verse, after those two verses that we looked at, he said, for no man can serve two masters. Either he'll love the one and hate the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Jesus knew exactly this end. And he was saying, see, what God has always wanted is our heart. That's why we talked about last week that generosity flows from the heart. It's not an outward constraint. It should never be something that we do grudgingly or of necessity. It should be in the condition of the heart because when God's got your heart, your stuff's never an issue because you know everything came from God and God is well able to fulfill his promises. God is well able. Is God trustworthy is the question we have to ask. And if you've ever been generous in your life, what you discover is a truth that has been eternally written for us, but tested out and proven age after age after age is that God is faithful, that God always does what he said he will do. If... We believe it. That's why the Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that he is. He's what? He is who he said he is. And that he will do what he said he will do. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So they gave themselves first to the Lord. And then to us by the will of God, verse six. And so we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring... Also to a completion, this act of grace on your part. In other words, he's telling those Corinthians, guys, in light of the Macedonian church, you guys have had it good. Okay, I get it. You've been spending it on yourself. I get it that other things have come up, but they've done it. I'm asking Titus to help you to complete what you said you would do. This grace on your part, look at verse seven. He said, but since you excel in everything in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in, and in love, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of what? Of giving. He said, listen, you have excelled in love, you've excelled in faith, all that's great, but don't neglect the grace of giving, to excel in this end. So you and I, and here's a fascinating thought to us. He, he brought up the Philippian church. Do you know, this is just a thought, and studying the Bible, fascinating reality. In the New Testament, the most joyful book ever written, the most joyful letter to a church was written to the Philippian church. And in fact, the most awesome promise in the area of finance that was ever given in the New Testament is found in the Philippians. That my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. What an awesome promise. But people pull that out of context and fail to realize why. Did God make that promise to those Philippians because of the life that they had been leading? Their life of generosity, Paul gave them the assurance of this, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. Just fascinating thought. So how do you know, listen to me, how do you know if the grace of God, the grace of generosity, the work of grace and generosity is working in you? Follow along with me as you close. We close this out, listen to me. If you're taking notes, listen. How do you know that the grace of generosity is working in you? It's when our conditions don't affect our, gener our generosity, but we remain motivated by a heart that trusts in God. When our conditions. See, as long as you allow the circumstances of your life to dictate what you believe, then you'll be controlled all day long by your enemy. See, people will turn around and say, we all can agree intellectually that if somebody hurts you, you need to freely and generously forgive them until you've been hurt and offended. And you say, no, you need to release. You need to be generous. You need to forgive because to forgive means to release a debt. They say, but you don't know what they did to me. You don't know how they hurt me. You don't. See, if you're allowed to be controlled by what you do, by the circumstances that you're in, your enemy will control you all day long. Your faith can never be dictated 
by the circumstances of your life. It must be dictated alone by what God says. And believing God above your circumstances is what faith is all about. That God's trustworthy. That God is not subjected to the conditions that you are under. That God is bigger than those. God is able to meet the need of his people. God is able to prosper his people no matter what the setting. But you can't allow your conditions to affect your generosity but to be remain motivated by a heart that trusts in God. See those Philippians? They said what? No, despite our circumstances, they pleaded with Paul. No, we're gonna get in on this because the safest place in the world to be is trusting God. Not with our words, but with our lives. And nobody compelled them to do it. Their heart motivated them to do it. Conditions. Look at the scripture with me in the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 11.4 says this. If you wait until the wind and the weather are just right, you will never plant anything and never harvest anything. Conditions. Don't you hear people say, oh, when my ship comes in, then I'll be generous. You know, that's a lie. Can I help you with something? If you can't be faithful with a little, then you'll never be ruler over much. But we live under these things going, you know what? I can't do it right now because this is going on and that's going on. And you're allowing conditions. See, it says here, if you wait for the perfect circumstances to plant your seed and to harvest your fields, you'll have nothing. You got to trust. Even because guess what? If you can already predict everything that's gonna happen, if everything is already laid out for you, there's no trust involved in any of that. There has to be a point at which, you ever play that game? Where you stand, someone stands behind you and you close your eyes and you fall backwards? Falling back into the arms of God is the safest place that any human being could ever be. But fear irrationally would say to you, God, well, I don't know, God. Am I gonna have enough? I don't know, God. The one who absolutely can guarantee the situations of your life, Jesus told us, don't worry. What you'll eat, what you'll drink, what you'll wear, where you'll live. Everybody in the world is dealing with those anxieties. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and know this. All of these things will your father provide for you. God is a good God and he is trustworthy. But until you don't allow your conditions to dictate it, but you allow your heart to be motivated by simply trusting in God. Secondly, secondly, how do you know if this grace is working for you? Listen, when generosity is a thing we get to do and not something we got to do. In other words, they saw these Philippians, they saw this as a privilege giving to the saints, not as a duty, not as a law. People have this debate all the time. Pastor Ken, is tithing under the law? Is tithing a New Testament reality? I'm like, whoa, there's only one law in the New Testament. It's the law of love. And love is the most generous reality on the planet. So therefore, don't be motivated by legalism. Be motivated by love. If God is good, love him with all your heart because he loves us and never has skimped out on us. See, generosity is not something you got to do. It needs to be something you get to do when you look at it that way. I was just recently in a conference that I spoke at up in Boston and one of the other conference speakers that was there was Matthew Barnett. Matthew Barnett is the pastor and leader of the LA Dream Center in Los Angeles, California. And Matthew told this story that so impacted me. He said this, he said, when the movie Frozen came out, he wanted to take his two young children to the movie. And so he realized because of the popularity of the movie, he decided to go down to the theater early and buy tickets. And when he went down to buy the tickets, he had this conversation with the Lord. Oh, it's so great to take my family. And the Lord says to him, Matthew, you said you wanted to take your whole family. Are you going to take your whole family? Now, see, to Matthew, what that meant was this. He looked at the people in the Dream Center as his family. In other words, there's a whole floor in the Dream Center that has taken in homeless families, families with people that found themselves disenfranchised by whatever condition that was, but now they're being cared for at the Dream Center. We had people right here from our church that went out there and saw this. And on this floor, there's a whole host of people who live. And so God was saying to him, Matthew, take your whole family. And Matthew says, Lord, do you know how many people that is? There's 224 people who live at the Dream Center. 
And finally, Matthew says, okay, God, all right. I'll buy them tickets to take them to the movie Frozen. So he tells the, 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 the person helping him, and she's like, yeah, he goes, I wanna buy tickets for my family, and that'll be 228 tickets. I'm like, okay, so he buys that. So he goes back, tells everybody in the Dream Center, taking you to the movies. And so they're all excited, euphoria, excitement. The day comes, they all go to the movie. Matthew gives the tickets. They all get into the movie theater. And the little kids that live at the Dream Center came up and they hug them on the, on the legs and say, thank you, Pastor Matthew, for taking us to the movies. Does it include popcorn? <laughs> and God says to Matthew, Matthew, when you go to the movies with your family, does it include popcorn? He says, all right, Lord. So he says to everybody, it includes popcorn. And all the kids are, yeah. And everybody goes, okay, so they get inside the movie theater and this is the part that touched me. He said, I sit down in my seat. And this little girl from the Dream Center comes up, no more than eight years old. She sits next to him. She leans her head on his shoulder and says, Pastor Matthew, thank you so much. I've never been to a movie before. Now, what does that do to your heart? I know what it did to mine. It crushed my heart. Because this, to be able, see, this is something that we get to do, not something we got to do. When you've been the one responsible to bless someone else, you know what I'm talking about. The joy inside is absolutely infectious. It's absolutely something. It's like taking drugs, we already found out. It's so cool, and it's not illegal, and it ain't fattening, and you don't have to worry about getting strung out. The deal is this. It's so cool. It's something we get to do, not something we got to do. And so how do you know? Lastly, if this grace is working in you, it's when God is truly first displayed by increasing generosity. In other words, is God really first in our lives or is that just lip service? Does God come first? You know, generally when it comes to giving, do we give what's left over after everybody else's obligations are met? Or does God truly come first? Who do we trust in to take care of us? And not just take care of us, do we believe God's big enough to not just meet our needs, but to give us access so that we can meet the needs of others? That's the blessed life. See, what I said to you last week is this. God invited every one of us into the opportunity to experience life as he lives it. Because God so loves that he gives. But today, here's the reverse, because a relationship is reciprocal, okay? It's mutual. Not only has God invited us into the opportunity to experience life as he, our generosity invites God into being involved in our stuff, in our lives, financially and every other way. See, when God comes first, the idea is this, as God blesses me, I will be a blesser. In other words, I don't just set a limit and say, okay, I'm just gonna give that. No, as God increases me, my giving should increase because what did he say to these Philippians? What, what? As you've excelled in faith and in love, allow the grace of giving to excel in you. I've seen people, guys, I know people. I did it when I was in business. People struggle with 10%, okay? I know people who live off of 10% of their earnings and give the rest of it. Because listen, what am I saying today? Listen, listen, listen. What am I asking? What's, what do we take out of this? Number one, it's a new way of looking at life. To apply this teaching today, it's to begin to look at life differently because your outlook, okay, affects your outcome. Nothing changes till you start to look at life differently. See, every time we have a chance to get involved generously in an affair, it's an opportunity for God to bless our lives in ways beyond any other opportunity to do because it's the invitation to say, God, I take you at your word. A generous man will prosper and he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. It's the opportunity to say, God, I put you first. I trust you above all else. This isn't something I gotta do. I gotta get over that attitude. I need to adjust my attitude. This is something I get to do. This is a privilege. This is the opportunity to live like God lives and experience life in a way beyond what my normal capabilities would be. So imagine what it would be like. Let me end with a story today. Let me tell you the story of Donald 
uh, uh, Royer. Donald Royer was a man that lived out in the Midwest. He worked for a manufacturing company for 25 years. In fact, he knew the value of a paycheck. He knew hard work. He had worked hard all his life. He led his team. In fact, his department that he was over was the most profitable for that organization throughout the years of Donald's service. All the other guys saw his work ethic, saw his, his tenacity and his, his uh, uh, business sense in that fact, and his work ethic inspired all of them. And his team produced year and year and year again. But because of his philosophy, about life, it didn't give in to philanthropy. It wasn't very philanthropic. Do you know what I mean by that? He wasn't a liberal giver. He wouldn't be considered a generous man, but one day he got a call that changed everything. His last living relative died. His uncle Luke, who had fought a long battle with emphysema, what Donald had not understood was that his uncle had developed a foundation. And in his foundation, there was over a million dollars. And because of Donald's work ethic and his good judgment, his uncle wanted to make him the head trustee of the foundation. And here was the caveat, here was the string. Donald's responsibility was to distribute that over a million dollars to worthwhile charities to help them in. Now, Donald was kind of not wanting to fulfill that end, kind of grudgingly, you know, kind of wanting to avoid that end. But he decided, you know what? If I don't do this, someone else is gonna do it and distribute those. I could at least honor my uncle's desires and make sure that the money goes to worthwhile causes. So he diligently got involved like he did everything else in life. He investigated uh, uh, charities and he determined ones that met his standards of what he would be considered good charities that were doing good works. And so he, you know, slowly began to give out small distributions, small uh, 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 charitable donations to a handful of organizations that he had found. And in the next few months, what started to happen was these organizations that he was giving to started to send back letters and testimonies of what was happening with the contributions that he was making. He started to read these correspondences that now children who were uh, hungry were now being fed. Kids that were orphans were now finding homes. Children who never had medical attention were now getting medical attention for the first time in their lives. Farmers in other countries that didn't know farming there were now learning methods that could now feed their entire villages. They were being taught ways. Churches were being raised up. People were being one to the Lord. And other nations in poor regions of the world, all of these things. And slowly but surely, as those testimonies poured in, month after month after month, the hard shell of his heart began to melt away until he decided that he wanted to take a trip and see where the money was actually working. He wanted to visit the places where the contributions were going and the people were being affected. And so he took the time, he would take some of his vacation time and go and visit these charities. But when he was there, what happened was, not only was his curiosity, but he was captured in his heart by the things that were going on. And he began to donate himself in his time. As he started, as he can, his uncle's foundation had a caveat that he had to distribute the over a million dollars in 12 years. But in that time frame, Donald began to go part-time with, with the plant that he had worked at all those years. And he worked there nine months and he would take four months of the summer and go donate his time to help at these charities because of what was happening in the field, because of the relationship that he made, the things that God was doing in him. And Donald began to go through it. In fact, he met the expectations of his, of his uncle four years ahead of time. By eight years, all the money, had been distributed out of the foundation that his uncle would put in, and then a true miracle happened. Donald began to invest his own nest egg in, back into the foundation to, to uh, supply where the depleted funds were once. And so now he was taking, and he went on a part-time uh, retirement where now he was going half of his time out and helping charities, volunteering his time. He was giving large percentages of both his income and his retirement packages to supporting the foundation and the generities and the charities that it was. In fact, Donald retired from his organization at age 71, but he didn't retire from charitable work. The next 15 years of his life, he stayed dedicated full time to giving himself and large percentages of his estate. In fact, he started a foundation, uh, 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 um, that would automatically from his estate replenish the charity 
throughout the years after he was gone. Now here's the deal. Donald's gifts, far more than the impact that they had on the places they were sent, was the impact that those gifts had on him because he changed forever. The joy that he experienced, the fulfillment of life that he understood that he who refreshes others himself will be refreshed. His entire spectrum in the way that he lived his life became entirely changed. He began to live what I've been talking about, the blessed life. It's a life dedicated to saying, God, it's not just what you do for me, it's what you do through me. So when God is able to work to you, God also wants to work through you. And when you begin to experience life in that end, you begin to experience the most blessed life there is. Now, it might have been easy. You say, well, Donald's giving away his uncle's money until it affected his own. But you ever think about this? I'll leave you with this last thought. None of us brought anything into the world. And none of us will take anything out of the world. So what are we actually being generous with? The stuff God has entrusted to us. And if God could give us already what we do have, could he not expand the increase of our capacity to live a blessed life? Is God truly faithful? Is God trustworthy? He's invited us all into this end to watch what only God can do. Because the grace of giving is something you yield to, never something you can work up. So.